Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to, to welcome you to our, our session today on, on Ukraine. Um, I want to introduce our, our, our two speakers. Um, my name is Jerry Green from the Pacific Council, as most of you know. And then I'm going to fade off in the, into the woodwork. They will have their conversation and time will be left at the end for, uh, uh, for questions from all of you. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you. This is a, a, a sobering uh, conversation on a challenging topic, and it's something we really can't revisit too often. Um, our, our guest from, from the East Coast is Kenneth Wallach, who is currently chairman of the National Endowment for Democracy and a member of the George W. Bush Institute's Advisory Council on Human Freedom. Um, Ken, uh, we've been friends for a lot of years, so forgive the, the, the familiarity. Uh, Ken served as co-chair of the Commission on Presidential Debates for the presidential and vice presidential debates during the lead up to the 2020 election and preserved his youth and sanity and good looks, which I can't fully fathom, but he's a, <laughs> uh, he's a, he's a tough guy. Um, he's actively involved in foreign affairs, journalism, politics, um, studying and understanding the United States and US foreign policy uh, for five decades. And for more than 25 years, uh, Ken served as the president of the National Democratic Institute, NDI, um, which is an NGO dedicated to advancing democracy worldwide. And this is an organization which the, politic, uh, which the Pacific Council has a lot of affection for Mark Nathanson, our co former um, co-chair, now ambassador to Norway, was on the NDI board. Nancy Rubin, uh, who's on our board, was so we have a very close uh, relationship with with NDI, which uh, many of us admire. Uh, Ken Fur's efforts on behalf of democracy was the recipient of the w, w. Averill Harriman Democracy Award, uh, the Presidential Order of Excellence, as well as honorary citizenship. Uh, from the Republic of, of Georgia, the National Order of Faithful Service from the government of Romania, and the Medal of Honor, uh, the Lithuanian Millennium Star from the government of Lithuania. The reason these are, are, are really important to mention is, is Ken, NDI, and others were supporting uh, these countries as they, as they made their efforts to move in the direction of, of democracy. Uh, the other thing before I introduce our, our other speaker, is Ken and I have had, you know, more than one conversation on the challenges to democracy in the United States. And this is something we will not talk about today, although it will require uh, great restraint. But we need to have Ken back, hopefully in Los Angeles one of these days, to talk about our democracy, which is, is uh, fragile and in my view, at least, at risk. Our second speaker is Dr. Anya, uh, Anya Grigis, who is a member of the Pacific Council, a, um, a uh, fellow resident of Southern California. Um, she is a non-resident senior fellow at our sibling organization, the uh, Atlantic Council. She's involved with their Eurasia. So I say sibling, there's step sibs, there's no DNA. We just, uh, we're part of the same community. Um, she works on, on, on energy issues, geopolitical issues, travels the world a lot advising uh, both governments and the private sector on, on the intersection of, of, of uh, geopolitics and energy issues. She has published three important books. Um, the first, The New Geopolitics of, National, of Natural Gas with um, being from Boston, I can say Harvard University Press. Um, Beyond Crimea, certainly timely before it was timely for for civilians. It was timely for the expert community, but not for everybody. She was a person ahead of her time. Um, Beyond Crimea, the new Russian empire, uh, Yale University Press 2016, and the politics of energy and memory between the Baltic states and Russia, uh, Rutledge in, in 2013, and it was reissued in 2016. Anya is an advisory board member of the McKinnon Center for, for Global Affairs at Occidental College, the Vilnius Institute for Policy Analysis, Analysis LitGas, and many, many others. She's testified um, in front of the Senate, Foreign, the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources 
on American LNG exports to Europe. And I received an email from Ambassador Mark Nathanson in Oslo. And he said, I was just briefed by the most remarkable person. You must meet. meet. So of course I shamelessly said, she's uh, one of our members and someone well-known and deeply respected by us. Final point, the Pacific Council is sending a delegation to uh, Norway and Finland in April. Um, Having our former co-chair as ambassador to uh, Norway certainly helps, but these Ukraine issues and energy issues go go you know go even to the most northern most re reaches of, of of Europe. So this is something that uh, we're, we're we're most excited about. Uh, Ken, Anya, thank you so much. Val, who is um, you don't see but makes all the magic happen, thanks to you. And I'm going to step out of the way and let everybody get to work. Thank you all again. Bye bye. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. And I want to hand over now the Mick right to Ken for his opening remarks. And we will then continue the conversation. And we will also have room for Q&A from the audience. So please think of your questions. You can start even jotting them down, sending them in, you know, in the Q&A section, and we'll get to them soon. So Ken, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anya. And, and thank you, Jerry. Um, I think it's at the outset, let me say, I think it's important for understanding the origins of the war in Ukraine, uh, the importance of our engagement and the need for Ukraine ultimately to prevail. Um, one needs requires to understand what President Biden has called the global battle between autocracy and democracy. And unlike that tagline in the famous tourism ad, what happens in Moscow, or for that matter, Wuhan, Damascus, or Burkina Faso, doesn't stay there. In short, the outcome of this war in Ukraine matters. And it matters not only for the people of Ukraine, but also for a Europe whole and free and for global security. Um, I've been involved in the democracy support community now for close to 40 years. And I will say that in recent years that efforts to advance democracy globally has in certain circles become an issue of some debate. Uh, paradoxically and wrongly in my view, it is seen as too bellicose conflated with regime change and military force or too soft or idealistic as a response to serious security threats. The real issue, however, is not whether democracy promotion is hard or soft or fits neatly into a realism or idealism paradigm. The issue is whether advancing democracy is a means of advancing our collective interests and protecting our security. And I think the answer is clearly yes. Um, we have learned a great deal over the past 40 years about the relationship between democracy and security. The first is that regimes that repress their own citizens are more likely to act aggressively beyond their borders. And this has tragically been borne out in the extreme by the consequences of one man rule in, in Russia and now in China. Second, that hotspots more likely to erupt in violence are found for the most part in areas of the world that are non-democratic. These are places that experience ethnic conflict and civil war, they harbor terrorists and produce illegal drugs, and they generate refugee flows across borders and regions. And if our ultimate foreign policy goal is a world that is secure, stable, humane, and safe, and where the risk of war is minimal, then our individual and collective efforts to advance greater freedoms and human rights globally represent a convergence of our values and of our interests. There is no doubt that we have witnessed almost a 17 year democratic recession with a decline of political rights globally, along with a decreasing number of democracies. There are many reasons for this, and if we want to touch upon this later in the hour, we can do so. Um, at the risk of oversimplification, there are many categories of 
authoritarian or authoritarian leaning countries. But I wanted just to highlight on the first and perhaps the most important category. It is a category um, that uh, Anne Applebaum, the well-known scholar and uh, journalist has called Autocracy Inc. And this is led by China, Russia, and Iran. Uh, these three countries are certainly not linked by ideologies. They are communists, they are nationalists, they are theocrats. They have built corrupt financial structures, developed strong security cooperation, and established far-flung media operations. Because their goal is to enrich themselves and to stay in power, they are more or less impervious to international criticism. What we have seen is a common feature of these regimes, and that is their willingness to use almost unimaginable brute force to put down any real or perceived threats to their power. This was certainly the lesson they drew from the Tiananmen Square in 1989 and from the color revolutions that unfolded during the early years of this century in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Democracy Inc. also has client states or junior partners in the company. And they include Burma, Nicaragua, Cambodia, Venezuela, Cuba, Syria, Belarus, and the states of Western Sahel, particularly Sudan, uh, Mali, and Burkina Faso, that have in recent months and years experienced military coups. These countries have benefited from Autocracy Inc.'s economic and security assistance, and Democrats in these places are, are finding that they not only are confronting their in-country regimes, but also multiple autocrats from multiple countries. Now for the good news. Autocracy Inc. is failing a series of stress tests. Uh, they do not have important stories to tell as of late. And this would have been predicted by Aaron Asimoglu and James Robinson in their highly acclaimed book, Why Nations Fail. The problem with authoritarian regimes, they wrote, is that when they are wrong, there is no one to stop them from disastrous results, end quote. China's march to economic prosperity masked the military, uh, the millions of uh, uh, citizens who were killed during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And today, widespread protests over COVID restriction policies have morphed into opposition to Xi Jinping's arrogation of political power. As for Putin, he grossly underestimated Ukrainian military prowess and resolve and overestimated the military capabilities and tactics of his own forces. He faced, he faced unpredictably from his standpoint, a country of, uh, of many armies um, not a nation with an army. And in Iran, we are seeing the world's largest civil rights movement, a movement as in China that may very well have been inspired by the courage and resilience of the Ukrainian people. So while Autocracy Inc. strength derives in part from its cohesion, its inevitable failures become contagious. And this is one important reason why it is important that we ensure that Ukraine wins this war. We are now, as we all know, entering, we have entered the second year of this brutal war. And for all the military experts that I have heard from and spoken to, there is a, I think, a conventional view or a general consensus that this is becoming a war of attrition and dangerously so, because a war of attrition will ultimately favor uh, the, uh, the Federation of Russia. And it is a reason why 
the level and sophistication of Western military aid should be geared towards achieving an early Ukrainian victory this year. Um, there is, and I think you will be hearing more calls from a small, still small, uh, still nascent, but growing more vocal group of uh, foreign policy experts. They come from the left, they come from the right, and they come among the realists in the cent center, uh, primarily from Mr. Um, Mearsheimer and Walt. Um, they have argued that given the human suffering, uh, given the politics, geopolitics, that the United States has to be in the forefront of forcing a immediate ceasefire and early negotiations. What's troubling by this view is that the negotiations in their view will ultimately lead to Ukraine ceding important sections of the country to Russia. And what is disturbing about this group of experts is they seem only to care about geopolitics and deep down will argue that the US is largely responsible for the Russian invasion. They care, um, they believe very little in Ukraine agency and believe that Ukraine is a product of the United States. Now such an outcome of a negotiated settlement is a dangerous one. It does not produce peace, but merely postpones further conflict. Moreover, which few people talk about, this will have an unbelievable impact on Ukrainian politics. We can't forget that President Zelensky had about a 20% or perhaps in the teens popularity before this war. His popularity stands at about 90% today. And that is because 90% of the Ukrainian population and all the public opinion research are optimistic about the future of their country. They're optimistic about the future of their country because they believe deeply that Ukraine will prevail. They believe deeply in a Ukrainian victory, a Ukrainian victory that includes a democratic state and a sovereign state in all of its territory. So should the international community attempt to pressure the Ukrainians into premature negotiations? Should Putin sue for peace eventually in the hope of retaining 20% um, of Ukrainian territory? That may be the very end of the, the Zelensky government. And it is not likely that we would uh, look upon favor of what his successor would look like. Because this is where you could conceivably see the emergence of an ultra nationalist leader um, that is protecting uh, the country's interests where the current president would not. So I think it's important and I think President Biden is committed and I think the Europeans are committed currently to stay the course. I think that is a wise policy. I think it is an important policy. I think the president has been courageous and forthcoming in, 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 and generous in the types of weaponry we are providing um, and the speed upon which we are providing. It's an enormous uh, enterprise, um, but I think it has to accelerate and the types of equipment have to be even more sophisticated if we're gonna achieve if the Europeans are going to achieve, and most importantly, if the Ukrainians are going to achieve um, uh, an ultimate victory in this conflict. So I will leave it at that, Anya. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate these opening remarks. Um, and I also wanted to welcome our audience here. Um, I'm gonna proceed with some questions for Ken, but please write your own questions in the Q&A box. So Ken, you know, you mentioned this use of force to 
squash democracy, right? Uh, the regimes that do it to their own population. And if we look at the case of Ukraine, this is the case of uh, Vladimir Putin's regime trying to squash a, a nascent, a, a democracy that's starting to flourish on its borders, essentially Ukraine's democracy. This is part of what this war is about. Um, you had also mentioned um, the work that has been done on failed states. And you know, this I'm currently working on a new book project with a group of colleagues, uh, essentially um, titled Russia, a failed state, where we're looking at different angles of you know, the economy, the energy sector, the society, and so on. Um, truly looking at Russia's regime and that of that of a failed state. And uh, I wanted to now ask you, because you brought up a very important point where many individuals are indeed, well, some, right? Uh, some experts are trying to question. Um, you know, what kind of a truth could this be, right? What kinds of concessions could there be uh, in this current war? Um, the Foreign Affairs recently had an Ask the Experts Forum. Um, and I, I recommend for folks who are interested to look this up as well. And, and you were, the and you were was, part of that, Anya. Yes, I was part of that. And I gave my comments there as well. Um, the question was, will Ukraine wind up making territorial concessions to Russia? And, uh, you know, my position was that I disagreed with this, disagreed with this strongly, because first, in the current position, Ukraine, you know, is uh, Ukraine's resilience, resolve and capabilities on the battlefield, coupled with the support around the globe, makes Kiev, you know, unlikely to accept a settlement. And certainly uh, there would be no reason for, for it to do so at the moment. But I wanted to ask your opinion, Ken, what is your view? Um, again, on this, the way the questions are being framed today, should we even be discussing this? Will Ukraine wind up making territorial concessions to Russia? Um, my, my answer was the answer, I, I think, what you gave in that, in that survey of, of experts. And, um, you know, if we believe that Ukraine is a sovereign state, if we believe that sovereignty resides from the people of a country, I think the resounding response um, from a, an important country, you know, Madeleine Albright, when she was Secretary of State, named the four, what she considered to be the four most important countries in the world. It was Colombia, Ukraine, Nigeria, and Indonesia. And so if we believe that a country has agency, that sovereignty derives from the people of those countries. And, and what we're seeing now on the ground is not just an army that is fighting bravely, but an entire nation that is fighting bravely. And they're fighting bravely for two important principles. Number one is the sovereignty, the territorial sovereignty of the country. And number two, um, the freedoms and, and democracy that they believe would be guaranteed to them um, in, uh, in their integration into the institutions of Europe. Um, and so the idea that outside forces uh, would seek to go over the head of, of, of the Ukrainian people and somehow try to cut a deal with somebody who is, I'll use a, a diplomatic term of art, a thug, um, is, is um, <laughs> is the worst thing can happen, not only for the conflict itself, because it wouldn't end the conflict, but for the ripple effect this would have, I, I think, globally. And I think the one thing that we have to understand, because people can talk about territory, and it's, it's sort of inanimate. Um, we can talk about lines and territory and who gets what, but ultimately we're talking about occupied people, not occupied territory. And what we're seeing happening in the occupied territories right now in Ukraine is unbelievable in terms of murder, rape, kidnapping of children, uh, being brought into Russia to be indoctrinated. Um, the idea that a Ukrainian government would cede a significant portion of his or her country to the rule of the Putin regime would be unimaginable. And so therefore the question becomes, does the international community support the aspirations of the Ukrainian people, 
recognize their sacrifices and give all the means necessary for them to achieve the victory that they rightly deserve. Absolutely, Ken. I agree with you 100%. Now, the costs of this war are incredible. I mean, just last night, Russia launched 81 missiles on the territory of Ukraine. One of the largest attacks since the start of the war, six ballistic missiles were launched. Um, if we look at the, the losses for Ukraine since the start of the war, 8 million refugees, you know, 50,000 war crime allegations. Uh, the economy is down by a third, infrastructural damage of, uh, you know, 138 billion. Of course, they've been receiving a lot of assistance as well from the EU and um, the United States. I mean, gr global, gra their grain exports are down. I mean, you know, hit in every, in every area. But again, same for Russia, right? I mean, Russia's army, there's estimates that they're losing about 80% uh, of, the, of, their, of their armed forces. Um, they, they were spending about $82 billion in just the first nine months of the war, um, you know, from basically 10, you know, 10 billion a month in terms of their costs. I wanted to ask you, Ken, um, how do you evaluate both Russia's and Ukraine's capacity to sustain the war? Really, whose side time is on? And you hinted at that in your, in your opening remarks, but uh, also not just from a military perspective, you know, from the domestic political sustainability, from the economic sustainability, and also the sustainability of Western alliance. So I so quite, quite a lot of questions for you um, there from the different angles. Well, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to it. Um, I do though, from talking to people who are more apt to be uh, prophetic, they believe this is the real problem because Putin is willing to sacrifice most anything to achieve his goals. Um, we have seen the use of tens of thousands of prisoners. He has basically run out of prisoners right now to use uh, and the prisoners of the Wagner group. He's relying on mercenaries from, the, from Chechnya and other countries. Um, but he has a resource, uh, an untapped resource uh, that the Ukrainians don't have. And that's uh, an infinite number of bodies that he can throw into the conflict. And then if you have the Iranians and others supplying um, military hardware, and he can put the country on war footing, um, he can inflict a lot of damage over time. Um, however, there is a problem at some point in Russia, at some point, and I don't know when that is, there are huge political repercussions. I don't know whether from which direction that will come. I don't know whether it will come from the military. I don't know whether it will come from the right. I don't know whether it will come from, from the left uh, for the more liberal elements of the country. But at some point he risks his own hold on power. Um, and when, where that is, where that point is, I don't know. On the Ukrainian side, um, obviously, um, obviously the, the, the sense of uh, loss of life is more important to Zelensky. But as of now, he has a country that is totally on his side. They are the ones that have made a choice that they are going to sacrifice their livelihoods and their lives for this cause. So right now, he's got an inexhaustible, almost, a national unity behind, behind, um, behind this war and behind repelling uh, the Russian forces. The question I think is most important in this is what's the resolve of the West? What's the resolve of Europe? And what's the resolve of the United States? Do we have the commitment that will meet the same commitment that is, has been made by the Ukrainian people? Um, if there is a diminution in support from the West or a sense that we are trying to pressure the Ukrainians into premature negotiations or concessions, I think then you will see some real difficulties. So I think the question is, 
right now, and I think Putin is counting on this diminution of support. He's counting on the West, uh, the exhaustion of the West. Um, and as you said, Anya, this is costing a great deal of, of money. Um, we're drawing down weapons in a way that we haven't done since, uh, I don't think since World War II. Um, there have been you know, probably more than a dozen huge drawdowns on our military equipment. So the question is, what is the Western resolve in this? And I'm convinced if there is a Western resolve to support the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians stay united, which I think they will, the question becomes at what point does Putin face an internal threat to his, to his regime? Absolutely, Ken. And I think the real casualty of this war can be truly Putin's regime and also the fragmentation of the Russian Federation itself. If we look at the different regions of Russia, mm -hmm. the ones that are bearing the brunt of this war, the different uh, eth ethnic minorities that are being sent to battle disproportionately in comparison to you know, the population, of, of course, in Moscow, St. Petersburg. So I think this is a real, real risk for Russia. But again, you know, it's uh, wh who's, whose side is time on and how long, as you say exactly, can the Western alliance be sustained? Um, and again, probably that uh, domestic commitment in Ukraine is there and will remain. So there are, well, I wanted to ask you, as we were talking about this, uh, the sustainability of the Western alliance, I mean, to what extent do you think this invasion, this Russia's invasion of Ukraine, reinvasion, right, has reshaped not only regional, but also global security priorities uh, for, for the United States, for the European Union and, and others beyond? It's, it's complicated. I, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question and a complicated question. And, and it's, it's, you know, we, we live, as you know well, Anya, in a, in a, a multipolar world now. And um, I, I think that this war has united as, as ever it has been, the NATO alliance and our European allies. Um, now you can take Hungary and you know, maybe one or two others as weak, li weak links in that, but it has united the transatlantic alliance in a way that we haven't seen for, for many, many years. Um, it, is more it is more complicated beyond that. Um, India itself has, has other issues that it has to deal with, a long relationship with Russia. Um, it has um, taken Ukraine's side um, uh, politically, diplomatically, in terms of Ukrainian sovereignty, but it still purchases Russian oil. Um, you have uh, you have a the global South um, that is more or less united. It, it, it's it's interesting that you had two UN General Assembly resolutions on this war, one that condemned the invasion and one that condemned the the annexation by Russia of Ukrainian territory. That vote was 141 to 193. Um, so 141 of the 193 um, uh, members of the, of the UN General Assembly voted to condemn Russia. And that's been unprecedented. So, so that has been positive as well. But again, there are individuals within the global South Brazil is another one. Um, India uh, is another. South Africa um, is, is, is a third. That they have these complicated relationships. And they don't, in a sense, don't want to choose between the United States and Russia or the United States and China. And so what, what the Biden administration, I think, has done wisely, and President uh, Lula was in... in um, Washington in, in recent weeks, that he concentrated on areas in which the United States and Brazil can agree upon and build on that rather than trying to push Brazil to make a decision on the war. Um, and I think what you'll be seeing is a strengthened alliance 
um, but, but certain countries, uh, regional powers, um, emerging powers that are still going to um, hedge their bets to, to some degree. Um, but I think that is offset in large measure by the strengthening of the transatlantic alliance and the strengthening of alliances in Asia who are less fearful of Russia as they are of China. Um, and I'm speaking of the Philippines, I'm thinking of of, of, of Indonesia, and not to speak of Japan and, and Korea. Thank you. And I'm glad you brought up India. I actually have a follow-up question on that, but I also wanted to shout out to our audience to write your questions in the Q&A section, and I'll turn to, turn to those shortly. So when it comes to India, um, you know, this is the world's largest democracy. And at the same time, as you say, it has a historic relationship with Russia. Um, it is a country that, in my view, can really tip that balance when we look about when we look at the global order and we look at that competition between democracies and authoritarian or governments autocracies. What is your view? What do you expect that will happen with India in the coming years? Do you think this war could even be a decide, deciding factor, right? In India's positioning in the future or not? I, I, I don't think so. I, you know, I think uh, obviously, I, you know, the, obviously the Indians um, do not like what is taking place in the war. Um, it, 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 there is no doubt that Russia's position um, internationally has been weakened dramatically by this war. And what you're doing is the only ones that are are trying to benefit from the Russians are places like the, the, the military leaders in places like Mali, Burkina Faso and Sudan um, that benefit not only from, from uh, uh, economic assistance from the Russians but from mercenary forces that are protecting, protecting these regimes. Uh, but there's no doubt that they, they, it has weakened Russian specifically Russia's position. And I think India will continue to, to move away from the Russia. The question is whether it will, what it will do when it comes to Russia, Russian oil. I don't think the Indians are going to begin accepting severe sanctions against the Russian regime. But as, as the Russians continue, position continues to deteriorate, I think that there's a chance that the Indians then move further and further away from the Russians and closer to the US. Yeah, absolutely. Those energy sales, if we take a look, I mean, since the start of the war, India has been buying large volumes of Russian uh, Russian oil, um, buying that at a discount, of course, now, because Russian oil is discounted. So and they're the in Chinese a way- kind of, too, And the Chinese as well. And the Chinese, of course, um, as can be expected, and the Chinese buying the Russian gas as well and Russian LNG. So um, I have a question here from the audience and we'll, um, I, I think also later I'd like to come back a bit to the question of the global south, but I have a question from the audience from Madeline Blideru. Um, the question is, uh, how could the neighboring countries defeat war fatigue? And I, I believe the question here is maybe for the Europeans, right? For the European Union, for the Western Alliance, um, particularly at the level of their population and their economies. Uh, so uh, there is a certain sense of war fatigue, you can say as well in Europe, right? Um, so what else could motivate them to stand strong and stand in support of Ukraine beyond kind of the existential security threat if Ukraine fails? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I don't think the answer is the United States stepping in for filling, filling filling those needs uh, because our, our commitments are, are rather large as it stands. I think, you know, I, I, I do think that there are states um, in, in the European Union who are most, feel most affected by this war and that's the states bordering, uh, exactly. bordering Russia. Uh, the the Baltic, closest to Russia, yes, so the, the more resolve they have. Absolutely. And that's, there is no doubt that the Baltic states and Poland and uh, the new government in Moldova, and you have, you, you have the, the, the country, Finland, you have the countries that feel most threatened. 
And I think that they can play an increasingly important role in um, educating the, the, the what Donald Rumsfeld called the new Europe. <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 uh, or the old Europe, that, that they can do a, a job united, uniting in this and trying to, um, uh, trying to engage, uh, engage the, the Europeans to determine from their perspective what's at stake and what's at stake for, the, for Europe, uh, for a Europe that is going to be whole and peaceful and prosperous. I think that is something that they can do. They can play a role and to bolster the leaders of those countries in, in the UK and France and, and Germany and, and, and the others. Mm -hmm. We have, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Carol Hamilton and she's asking how effective do you think the sanctions against Russia have been? And I have a couple of actually numbers here. So, yeah. uh, you know, in the, there were a lot of discussions in the in the spring that Russia was still getting a billion dollars a day from oil and gas sales, right? And that's no longer the case. Um, today, oil is really you know sold at a discount to Asia. If we look at the European gas markets, Europe used to depend about forty percent on Russian gas. Today, that number is down to about nine percent. Russia's budget revenues are down by about thirteen percent. But overall. Um, Ken, how do you see how effective have sanctions been? Well, um, you know, John McCain once described Russia as a uh, gas station with nuclear weapons. Um, they they certainly don't have they have an aging population and and they do not have a diversified economy. Um, but I think in terms of the one commodity they do have, uh, they've been able to survive this conflict. Um, because of the oil revenues coming in, particularly from China, particularly from, from India and some from other places. Um, I, I think this, you know, what always amazes me is that it seems like every month or two months that the West uh, is announcing um, new sanctions. And, um, and I, and I always think, well, why didn't we put these sanctions on a week ago or a month ago or six months ago? Or a year and, ago or years or a year ago. ago. <laughs> you know, let's let's do it all at once. And it may be, you know, I, I'm not sitting in NSC meetings at the White House, but it, it may be that, you know, there are political issues too that the administration is dealing with with our European allies. And in all of these decisions on, on sanctions, it requires sort of a collective action. And the question is, how do we ramp these things up in a way that we can present a united front? And if we did these things all at once, it, it may have may it, you don't want it to fall under its own weight. Um, and so that may be the strategy that is taking place within the administration. But one of the things I think we can do, there, there are things that we can do. Number one, I think the notion of sending planes um, is, is would be important and to begin to do it in a significant way. Secondly, I think the, the use of Russian at frozen assets could be used immediately. And um, I think, um, and I think an, an expanded um, uh, Magnitsky Act to a lot more people in, in the country um, and, and to those people who are aiding the, the Russian war effort. Um, of identifying individuals, uh, both the Europeans and the and the Americans, um, and putting them on that 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 sanctioned list. So I think, and and there are a bunch of banking issues too that can be done. I just think we have to accelerate the sanctions issue uh, to the to to the maximum, and we have to begin accelerating the uh, uh, the weapons flow and the sophistication of those weapons, and the combination of those two things I think are important. Um, and ultimately, um, with the goal to try to bring this war to a, to a conclusion this year. Mm -hmm. And there's, thank you, and there's a, a question from an anonymous um, participant uh, that actually follows up on this, particularly the our um, weapons and the weapon supplies. I don't know if uh, you can answer this question, but are we sending surplus equipment to Ukraine or equipment from our frontline units? Um, 
that the, the I, I don't know exactly the answer. I, I think it's I think it's it's mostly from from our supplies, um, not from the frontline units. Um, and um, and of course the Europeans are are providing it as well. But it's mostly from our we're drawing down from our our arsenals that we have. The question becomes, how do we replace them? In, in a timely fashion. And that's where you're seeing a ramp up in terms of military production and increase in our, our military budget is how do you fill in um, uh, the, the, the stockpiles that are being uh, depleted or, or drawn down for the, for the war. And I think that's, it's a real challenge because it's rather significant. And all you have to do is see the pictures in, in, uh, of, of this equipment um, in, in Eastern Europe, ready ready to enter the battle, and to see the extent of it, it's rather it's rather large. Mm -hmm. And also, too, the, the the question of tactics and how you how you use the equipment and and how quickly you use the equipment, and there are different views on this as well. Um, and uh, and the Ukrainians right now are using a lot of the ammunition very 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 quickly. Um, no, absolutely. This is um, this is becoming a pertinent question in terms of uh, you know restocking, uh, restocking the the supplies, restocking uh, the weapons, the machinery, um, and so on. Uh, and I'll note for the audience, this is probably your last chance to write a question. Um, so please do in the Q and A box. And I wanted to ask you, Ken, about um, you know. There are a lot of discussions about Russia's spring offensive, right? Um, particularly the what? in March, uh, spring offensive, Russia's yeah. spring offensive, like a new line of attack. Um, uh, what do you think about that? What do you think is really next? Uh, what's next for us in spring in this conflict? I don't know. I, I think you're seeing the battles being waged now that the Ukrainians are putting a lot in the battle in the battles right now, in in places that are viewed as not particularly strategically important, but rather it's a way to draw in the Russians so they're not capable of having that type of spring offensive. Um, and you can, you, you can call it sort of a wartime rope-a-dope strategy that the Russians right now are pouring, you know, it becomes cannon fodder, pouring tens of thousands of soldiers into, into this current battle. And I think the Ukrainian strategy is to uh, to wear them down so they don't have the capacity for a, a major offensive in the spring because they don't have the ammunition, uh, the military hardware, they don't have the personnel to have such an offensive in, in the spring. Um, uh, I, I just, you know, I, at some point, it's going to be very, very difficult for the Russians to have a, and, and, and and certainly the Ukrainians have been brilliant so far in the way that they've strategized. And I have to assume it's not only their, um, their military prowess and, and, and good military thinking on their part, but I have to assume that the United States is working closely with them as well on, on this strategy. And so far it's worked. And so we'll see, I think the outcome of this offensive uh, or in terms of trying to uh, you know, to, to thwart this offensive by the Russians will be an important one to determine what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Another question from Dr. Nola Hines. The U.S. is committed to this war until Ukraine decides something differently. In your opinion, how will um, this Congress play a role in either increasing or decreasing funding? And of course, the big funding question. Well, being in I, DC, what is yeah, your what is your view? Well, you know, I, I I think you have Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and and a handful of others getting a lot of media attention, um, and those who are uh, questioning uh, the amount of aid, and even you have the speaker who um, who continues to talk about uh, uh, no blank checks. Um, so I, I do believe that there may be more hearings, there may be more questioning, um, but from everybody that I have talked to, um, that the center um, is very, very, uh, 
solid and it is very, very deep and it is pretty wide. And you're only talking about the fringes um, that, are, um, that are questioning what the commitment. And as long as it is only the fringes right now politically, and you have a White House that it's firmly committed. And so you have, have virtually 100% on the Democratic side. You had one attempt by the Progressive Caucus um, to write a letter to the president um, trying to pursue a, a negotiations for a, a settlement of the conflict and a ceasefire. And that was withdrawn. Uh, a letter that was signed by some 30 members of Congress was withdrawn because of the heat that they received. So, you know, there may be cracks here or there, but if you look at the statements coming out by both sides of the aisle, uh, most of the leadership, um, I, I, I'm pretty confident that, um, uh, that, that the center is gonna hold for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. And I think that support goes beyond uh, DC and the Hill. You know, I'm always surprised when I'm, you know, driving, you know, traveling through California, other parts of the country. Um, and in some of these neighborhoods in the middle, you know, you know, you may say out of nowhere, and you see, so, you know, Ukrainian flags, you see that support, um, you know, dra draped across again, uh, houses, cafes, restaurants. So I think that support in the American public is very deep and very broad. I wanted to, perhaps our last question from the audience, and um, you know, I wanted to turn the attention towards Russia, Russia itself domestically, and what we can expect there. In uh, official, right, official polls say that Putin has 80% support, right, 80% in February 23. I don't know if we believe that number, we don't believe it. But I wanted to, to give this question to Bradley Hart. Um, his question is, how do you expect the Russian government and the Russian public would respond if uh, the Ukrainian offensive is successful? Um, and, uh, you know, if they succeed in this war and if their forces begin to approach the pre-war border of Russia itself. So, I mean, if we're talking about Luhansk, Donetsk, uh, maybe um, Crimea. Well, you know, listen, the, the one thing about about the Russian people um, is that um, uh, the, 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 the regime, the Kremlin controls all news sources. And if, if um, this regime is forced to withdraw from Ukraine as it did in Afghanistan, I imagine the spinmeisters in the Kremlin and Putin himself can come up with a, a line of reasoning uh, that um, uh, that would uh, would satisfy the the, the 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 vast majority of the Russian people, the the seventy percent, the eighty percent, the sixty percent of the people that that back him strongly. And I, you know, I or or if there is, I think what what is. I think it's less about the Russian people uh, and more about the military and the people around around Putin. Mm -hmm. You know, could could that impact a a some type of coup or some type of move against um, against uh, Putin? Rather than it's it's not. I don't think the Kremlin is going to respond to public pressure because I don't. I wouldn't count on Russian public pressure. Um, Although, and, and as you said from the very beginning, Agnia, the reason why Putin moved in this war had very little to do with NATO expansion. And it had, it, had, it had everything to do with, I think what he sees as a threat of an independent democratic Ukraine on his border. And I think that he views that as an existential threat to his uh, continued uh, reign in in Russia um, from an ideological perspective, not that Ukraine is a threat in itself no, in any sort exactly. of way, but just simply the idea yeah. that a large Slavic uh, country on the border of Russia, right, he, a brotherly yeah, nation, that he can, could be that he considers right? that he considers to be part of Russia. Um, he doesn't see a separation between Russia and Ukraine. So if that country is a 
sovereign country, a prosperous country, squarely in the European camp. Um, he, this is somebody who has been extraordinarily threatened by the color revolutions that took place in Serbia, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Georgia, Ukraine. Um, and uh, I know from people who have met with, with Putin, he believes that these were CIA coups um, and he feels strongly threatened by the prospect of a color revolution. Um, and I think a, a strong independent Ukraine, in his view, probably is a precursor for, for that in, in, in his backyard or on the home front. Thank you. I, what you've noted, Ken, is very interesting that you believe, in fact, that if you know change occurs in Russia, it will be driven by the elite or the military rather than the public. I think that's, a, you know, I wanted to emphasize that point. And I, I think you're probably right. I wanted to ask a final question and then any closing remarks, if you want to provide those. But what do you really, what do you believe the future holds for Russia? Are you optimistic that we can see a democratic Russia in our lifetime? Um, yes, um, I do. Um, but you have to understand that I was in the optimism business for, uh, I've been in the optimism business for 37 years. And, you know, when people talk about the stability of authoritarian regimes, they, they have this sense of stability. Um, but in a sense, um, these are regimes that inevitably are going to fall. Um, and they're stable until they're unstable. And um, this world is replete with countries that we thought were, were run by um, uh, autocrats who understood their people, who had support of their people. And uh, we've seen this in the Middle East and that somehow that they will continue in perpetuity. And that never is the case that today uh, because of this interconnected and interdependent world, um, people are in a demanding mood. You know, they want to put food on the table and they want to have a political voice. And they're not willing to give up the latter for the former. And I think that inevitably, uh, because of the communication revolution, um, that inevitably these regimes become very brittle. And um, and that's why um, they, they act with such brute force, because to them, any semblance of independent thought or independent movement, let alone opposition movement, um, is met with, uh, with a very, very strong reaction. But eventually, that, that they, they light a, um, uh, a fire that ultimately uh, comes back to haunt them. And I think that's going to be the case in Russia too. And um, and there are brave people who you know you have some sixteen thousand that are in prison already. You have you have pockets of of opposition that are growing in the country. And um, I think it's a matter of time. I don't know when that time is, but um, this regime will be will become brittle as well. And this war, I think, will hasten that 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 day. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your remarks, Ken. And I agree with you. I, you know, people may talk about the stability of authoritarian regimes, but at the end of the day, they fall. I grew up in Soviet occupied Lithuania. I grew up listening to you know, Voice of America in my grandmother's kitchen with people, uh, you know, speaking in hushed voices saying that one day Lithuania, you know, Eastern Europe will be free. And you know that came to pass in my childhood and my early lifetime, and I think we will continue to see changes that favor democracy. So you are in the right business in the optimism democracy business. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you to our audience. Anya. Thank you so much, Anya.